So, I'm here with uh, Will Schick from Privateer Press. Okay. You're the, you're the, what's your uh, job title? I'm the director of business and brand for Privateer Press. Okay, of all the different brands? <laughs> yes. Okay, and you just recently added, uh, I believe, a new brand uh, with uh, Scrappers? Uh, actually, our newest IP is Level 7, um, and it's our new modern science fiction IP. It's going to be a transmedia property, so we're going to explore it through a bunch of different genres of games. The first one being Level 7 Escape, which is a survival horror board game for one to four players. Um, there'll be other games that come along uh, later on that will be different genres of games, but we'll explore the world in new ways and tell uh, the same story um, or continuations of the same story in different ways. Uh, we also have Heap, which is the newest uh, okay. game in our Bodgers game line of board and card games. And that one takes our classic cast of Goblin Bodgers and it puts them into this post-apocalyptic world of motor vehicle mayhem where they drive around in these crazy uh, bodged together vehicles with uh, all kinds of nasty weaponry and they fight over this giant towering pile of scrap so that they can get out their vehicles as, uh, better than anyone else and be king of the, the wasteland. Um, I frequently contribute to No Quarter, as many of my co-workers also do, uh, and that's a lot of fun. So, And No Quarter covers all of our products, but primarily focuses on War Machine, Hordes, and then of course the upcoming IK RPG, the Iron Kingdom's Full Metal Fantasy role playing game. And what would the rule set be for that? For, so it's a proprietary rule set, so we actually developed it from the ground up. Um, okay, so that's a step away from... Correct. Uh, it, it definitely, it definitely uh, it borrows a lot from the, uh, from the groundwork that was laid from the uh, original IKRPG that was done under the OGL. Um, but in terms of the rules mechanics, it's, it's brand new. Um, it borrows uh, its influence from War Machine Hordes, actually, so it's a 2D6 system where you roll, add a stat, and you're going against a target number, um, and there's uh, abilities to add additional dice and boost, as uh, War Machine Horror players are probably familiar with it. Um, so it's, it's uh, going to be familiar to people who play the tabletop industries game, but it's uh, far more intricate and in-depth, uh, just like any role-playing game should be. So it, it actually, it sounds like, just like the War Machines and Horse. Yeah, it, they're yeah. all based in the same world, um, in the Iron Kingdoms. Uh, this one takes a, a more uh, focused view in terms of uh, the world and allows you to kind of do, have more intimate explorations and adventures within it um, and focuses less on the larger scale conflicts between national armies that is happening in that, in that setting. Now, uh, what do you guys refer to War Machine and Hordes within the office? Do you call it Warma Hordes? <laughs> no, it's always War Machine and Hordes. Uh, they, they get their own distinction and it's um, they're, they're well they share the same setting and, the, and uh, they play well together. Um, we do we do treat them as uh, individual individual game brands, um, which they are to us. And uh, so it's it's always War Machine and Wars. And what what did you start off in the company doing? So I began I started with the company back in 2008 as a retail support development. So I was in charge of uh, informing retailers about our product products, helping them with uh, getting organized play, starting their store, getting product and the questions and everything like that. Um, it was a great position. It really helped me learn. Uh, names and faces and uh, who help promote our great games, who sell our great games. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a fun time and I, I really enjoyed my time there. Uh, I then moved in 2009 into the marketing coordinator position. Uh, shortly after that, I took over as the marketing director for the marketing department. Um, and then just last year, I moved into my new role. So it's been, uh, it's been a whirlwind and it's been great to kind of go through all these different departments and get a good feel for what the company does your press seems like you can really move around in the company a lot, right? Yeah. yeah. There's a, you know, um, we, we try to we try to always, like, try to identify what, you know, what talents and skills our crew members have. And we've got a great crew. Um, some of the best guys I've ever worked with, you know, in any, in any job that I've had. We're very passionate about the game. And uh, we, you know, we want to make sure that really if something needs to be done, and you go out and do it, then it's like, that should be rewarded, right? And uh, so we, we keep a little bit flexible in terms of like where different departments fall, and it's a very close-knit team. We work together on a lot of different projects, so there's a little bit of overlap in terms of what everybody kind of does, and we're always ready to pick up and help out one of our fellow team members. So it's certainly a fluid environment. Looking ahead to Gen Con, what, what will Privateer Press be offering at Gen Con? So uh, we'll be showing off a lot of great stuff. Uh, Level 7, the Iron Kingdom's uh, Full Metal Fantasy role-playing game. We'll also have a bunch of 
bunch of exciting new releases for War Machine and Fords. Um, it's gonna be it's gonna be a really amazing time, and anybody who's around in Indianapolis should definitely come by the booth and check it out because we're gonna have uh, plenty to see, plenty to do, and a lot of surprises. Will you be able to buy Level Seven? Yes. Yeah. It will okay. be pretty essential. Okay. Uh, and I, we may have talked about this. I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, is it possible that there will be miniatures in the Level Seven line at some point? I, at some point, certainly. There's definitely a, there's a lot of different, like I said, there's a lot of different genres of, of games between board card. Um, so anything is possible. And uh, you know, we we love making our miniatures, but it always has to fit what we're trying to, the story we're trying to tell, and the game we want to make. Um, and Level Seven Escape works uh, far better. Uh, with uh, standees to not only get a, a better price point of $54.99, which is, uh, in my opinion, great value for what you get out of that game, but also to really draw you into the world where, in a way that a miniature for a board game really can't. We have some fantastic illustrations work done by Nessa Osandran, who uh, has also graced the cover of the Iron Kingdom role playing game book, um, and several of our Hordes books and War Machine books at this point. Um, and so, all that taken together, uh, we make very conscious decisions about when a miniature will fit in a certain game line and when it will not. And uh, level seven certainly has its has its time on, uh, in the future. So I fully expect that uh, it's a very real possibility. How closely are you following the development of the video game? The War Machine video game? Yeah. That's being done by our partners at White Moon Dreams. Uh, it's a license, so by and large, uh, they handle a lot of the day-to-days and we only get periodic updates, so unfortunately, um, I don't have a whole lot of information on that. When, when that stuff happens, are you guys all clustering around someone's computer? or? Oh yeah, no, the, the second that they send something like a new animation or anything like that, or they have a question that we need to review, like everyone's really excited to see it. I mean, it's it's really uh, it's really awesome to be able to see uh, the, the things we deal with all the time, you know, the, the characters and the war jacks and all, and the units come to life on the screen and, and be animated and get to see them move and, you know, it's it's, it's great because White New Dreams uh, has done a really good job of, of understanding, you know, how these things would, would act in a, in a real environment. And, and a lot of times, you know, we get, we get little smiles on our faces we're like, yeah, that's exactly how an iron plan would swing its hammer. That's, that's how I always pictured, you know, a trencher reloading his rifle, that kind of thing. So it's been a lot of fun. Now looking around, uh, I think one of the things you guys are kind of proud about is your, your new booth. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, um, this year we're... We, uh, we upgraded, we, we got a whole new booth, a whole new setup. Um, Comic Con is a little bit of a taste of what's in store. Gen Con is, is going to take it and just crank it up to 11. Um, so we're very excited. Uh, and, you know, it's it's going to be a private to press, a con experience like you've never seen before. What do you, do you guys have a, a private name for this huge ironclad? I'm yeah, we call, behind. we call this guy Big Blue, actually. Um, and he's been with us for a couple years now. He made his debut at Lock and Load last year, which is our, uh, our games, our game convention in Seattle um, and you know he makes it on the road he's a little heavy to cart around but you know what he's totally worth it we love him and how much time does he take to set up uh, he's he was built by a creature FX company uh, based out of LA so they actually did a pretty good job of making him uh, easy for any you know non creature FX guys to assemble um, he usually takes around you know 30 to 40 minutes to throw together once you take him out of his crates get everything set up and ready to go uh, so you, but you ship him in? Yeah, we ship him in crates. So he's got he's got five different crates that he that he hangs out in in different parts. So the arms, the torso, uh, those types of things. For for those of us who've never been up to Washington to see anything, what Privateer does up there, where, where does Big Blue usually reside? Yeah, <laughs> he, uh, he gets to hang out in our warehouse uh, most of the time with, with the warehouse guys. Go, yeah. Is yeah. he is he uh, unass- is he assembled in the so warehouse? We, we so far we've kept him unassembled simply because. Um, uh, one, our lobby doesn't have enough space for him because it's way too big for us. So the warehouse still has the space. But our, of course, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, particulate in it and from talc and uh, those kinds of things, and we want to make sure they stay in pristine condition. So he stays he stays safely tucked away in his crates. Now, am I right that there is there's an iron lich, right? Correct. Um, yes, that was made uh, for the company way back. Uh, in, Early, and I'm not exactly sure of the years, but before I was with the company, um, he's he's awesome. He actually is in our lobby. He he guards the door. 
uh, we have a lot of fun. Uh, you know, he gets a Christmas hat every once in a while for, uh, for the holidays and that kind of thing. You just call him Iron Lich, or does he have no, a special he's, name? He's Asphyxius. He's Iron Lich Asphyxius. Uh, he's from the War Machine line. Oh, well, he's one of the war. He's one yeah, of the I hope I hope the viewers also know who he is. But sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, thank you for filling that in. Sure, sure. I, I know who he is. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you, so you just call him Asphyxius. Yeah. Oh, let's move Asphyxius. Let's bring him to the show. Let's not. Yep. Yep. Okay. Does he ever? Does he come out with with uh, Big Blue? The two have never been seen together because we're a little too afraid that they try to destroy one another. So we keep them separate. You know. Um, no, actually, uh, one of the, the things about his fix is that he's actually all raw metal. So he was done by a metalsmith, a welder. Um, he's very heavy. Uh, several staff members have like scar wounds from, from hauling him around because he doesn't like to be touched. So uh, he, he's been off the convention circuit for a little while, but I'm sure that at some point in the future he may start making the rounds again. Will we see a dire uh, troll? mall or something like that as one of the next possible pieces. I would never say never to anything. Um, I think that would be awesome to get like a dire troll next to the Ironclad. So, you know, anything's possible. How, how big is, just comparing your brands, how big is, uh, even though we can play the games together, uh, you know, Hordes versus War Machine? Um, the games actually have really good propriety, uh, propriety, propriety to each other variety to each other. Um, you know, so War Machine is the older game, it's the older system, it's been out a little longer than Hordes, uh, about four years longer. So it had a little bit of a head start, but really um, when you, you go to conventions and you look at uh, any kind of tournament standings or organized play stuff, you usually see a very, very almost even mix between the two and we're very happy with that and that's exactly kind of how we hope uh, the two games go because we, we love them both just as much equally. But yeah, we, we have the the imagery of uh, you know the the steam jacks and so on. So and we haven't had necessarily Ford's imagery. To, you know, this is what the company's known for. Is that is that right? Um, the the war jack is definitely a little more iconic. Uh, simply because I think it's it's very unique. Um, well, Hordes has some really stylistic war beasts in it, uh, specifically like Legion of Everblight, some of the Scorn uh, war beasts and the Dire Trolls, um, the the steampunk uh, mechanical fusion that is that is a warjack. Um, really kind of is what sets that setting apart, and it's very eye-catching to people. It's, like I said, it's not something you see anywhere else from any other like world setting, and so we do lean on that a little bit. Also, um, the owner and creator, one of the creators of War Machine originally, um, the Iron Clad is uh, one of his favorite warjacks. Matt so, Wilson? Yes, Matt Wilson. Um, so, you know, when uh, when he's the one footing the bill, you're going to give the man what he wants. And, uh, so. And so, uh, in terms of like Monster Apocalypse and things like that, you, we wouldn't see like uh, a Voltron or one of the other characters because this well, is this is Privateer Press, right? Well, actually, uh, before Big Blue, we we actually had a uh, we had Gorgodra from the Monster Apocalypse line, and he was with us for about three years um, and stood just about as tall. Uh, he was uh, he was kind of neat because he was inflatable, and so you know, he'd blow right up uh, very easily. And then he'd kind of hang out. And there's, I'm sure there's plenty of pictures people can find on him. But uh, after three years of touring with us, it was time to retire him. And just like Asphyxius, he, he went he went to the warehouse uh, and now uh, is waiting for his turn to come back. And Big Blue is taking the place. What, what do you play yourself? Uh, I play it all. So, um, you know, I play every faction in War Machine. Uh, you have everything I, painted? I, I do. Well, not everything. I used to have everything painted um, until I started working with the company, and then uh, I lost some of my free time to paint. Uh, I'm working on it, though, but I do. Uh, I have I have an armies for every faction in both War Machine, um, and I'm working on hordes. I'm just starting to score an army now, uh, which is the last Hordes faction that I don't actually own yet. Um, I played the RPG, uh, it was my one of my first introductions to the setting, so very excited to see that one coming back. Level 7 is actually, I was on the development team for that, um, and it's a game that's near and dear to my heart. It's, it's the most exciting product that I think we have coming out for me this year, personally. Um, I'm a very big board game player, and this is the game that I really want to play uh, with my friends and family and that kind of thing. And then uh, keep and Colonel Traps in our Bodgers line. Again, I love board and 
card games. Um, I have a group that plays regularly, and it's been a lot of fun to be able to bring those games back uh, and bring them out for game nights and those kinds of things. So. These tables are a, a whole lot easier uh, than a, a demo board, huh? Yeah, yeah. No, we're very, uh, we're very happy with uh, our, our new setup. Um, they have, you know, the rules that you need to reference real quick on there. They're a great help to the demoers to be able to point things out quickly. And they kind of uh, streamline play so that somebody who has no experience with the games can come in, get a feel for what goes where, and quickly, like, uh, uh, pick up the game and understand the basics. What Colossals do you own or uh, huge base models, for, sure. for example? Uh, well, right now, uh, I, own, I own a Conquest. I've got a storm wall that's waiting to get painted. Um, the Conquest I actually painted for the Battle Report in No Quarter 40 and 3, I believe. Um, and that was a lot of fun to be able to be like the first person to do a Battle Report with a Colossal uh, against our creative director, Ed Burrell. Uh, I also have uh, all the battle engines for both War Machine Hordes because I think they're just beautiful models. Um, they're, they're really, like I'm a painter at heart, I really like the hobby aspects of the game. Uh, it's, what, it's what keeps me involved a lot. I don't, I don't necessarily play every day or even sometimes every week, but I do, uh, I paint, you know, almost every night. So, uh, to see these like gorgeous centerpiece models that are just loaded with detail um, and really, you know, awe-inspiring, once you get them painted and you need to set them down, that to me is really exciting. So, uh, even though I don't necessarily have armies built for all the factions, I have all the battle engines uh, ready to go and I will definitely own all the colossals and the gargantuans because I think they're just amazing models and uh, they're worthy of being on the shelf and just on display. What's what's uh, the gargantuans for those of us who don't know? So, the gargantuans are going to be the Mountain King for Trollbloods, the Wolrath for Circle of Oros, uh, the Mammoth for Scorn, and the Archangel for Legion of Everblade. And that will have huge wings? It will have huge wings. It's, it's a huge it's, flying... It's, it's a big dragon. It's what everyone, I think, who's, uh, who's played Legion has been waiting for. At least, speaking for myself, it's what I've been waiting for since I picked up Legion in 2006. And can we also see a return? Uh, what, what are some of the other figures that you guys have, have planned at this point? For the immediate future? Yeah. Um, we have, with Colossals, we have new iterations of uh, our, some of our more famous War Machine Warlock Warcasters, uh, including um, a new version of Vlad, a new version of uh, Sebastian Nemo for Signar, wait, wait. a new version of Asphyxius. Um, mounted on a huge base. Not mounted on. A huge oh, okay. Base. No, oh, these just are, these are just war casters. So some of them sure. have gone to large bases, um, but the first huge base uh, warlock will be Lilith, um, who's the uh, Legion of Warlock or Legion of Everblood Warlock, and uh, she'll be coming out uh, next year. In terms of like, so I play Crix, uh, there's a whole bunch of like different types of Lich Lords and other things of where the company, you could, keep, you could bring out a whole bunch of Warcasters sure. as it is, right? We can. Um, you know, one of the nice things about the setting is it's very rich and um, there's a lot to draw on. Um, but, you know, we, we try to balance like not overloading new uh, new characters into the storyline um, with uh, the evolution of our, our main characters. So, um, you know, it's a careful it's a careful scale, and we want to make sure that uh, we continue to, to bring new options to army building, um, new options to play styles and that kind of thing, and we do tell uh, an engaging and exciting story that people can be invested in, and they can really they can really identify with certain forecasters and warlocks. And that's the challenge that we have internally when we decide, okay, um, where do we want to go in this? May I have your attention, please? Will Haley, Canaletti? Something that I I found very very cool that Privateer Press has done is the starter set, the all plastic starter set. You got the rules, you got the dice, uh, the price point uh, was eighty dollars either from buying it from an online discounter or so, something like that, right? Sure. Well, what's the MSRP? It's, it's ninety nine ninety nine. It's ninety nine ninety nine. Yep. So it costs. I got it for a Christmas gift or something. So it costs them a bit less. Sure. But 
uh, further plans to do something more with that? Yeah, we actually have a two-player starter uh, battle box coming out for hordes that features uh, Circle Orberos versus Legion of Everblight, uh, and we've actually uh, mastered new skinwalkers in plastic for that box, so it'll be all in plastic. It'll come with the digest size rule book and everything else that um, players got out of the War Machine two-player starter box. So uh, if you know War Machine isn't the game that appeals to you, you'll now have uh, great options with boards as well for getting getting into the game and having everyone to play right out of the box. What about concerns uh, from the community about, well, we want Signar and we want that sort of starter box? This is sure. So uh, the two-player starter box obviously features two of the four main factions, other than Prime and or Primal. Um, for players who aren't interested in either of those uh, factions, we always have our battle group boxes, which is how the game kicked off and launched in the first place. Um, those things form the core of an army. They're ready to play right out of the box, and uh, you know they have a lower price point to represent the fact that you're seeing one faction. So we try to make sure that there's options for anyone to get into the game at the place they want to be. Can you give us any insight into the process of, of choosing those two starter armies? How sure. does that work? Um, really, the process that that happened was, you know, we sit we sit down as a group with uh, our development team, um, myself and our creative team, and uh, we talk about you know what we feel is going to be the best introductory experience for players, um, and that comes down to a lot of different factors. So we we build a bunch of uh, possible lists out of models that we think uh, would make good contenders. Um, we like to structure them around the battle group as much as possible that already exists because we, we've tried and tested those for over 10 years now. We know they work. Um, and then, at that point, we play games. We play game after game after game with them. And we uh, really work to understand, is it working? Uh, is this a game where not only is it um, you know easy to get into right away, uh, so no heavy complex rules interactions, nothing that can be confusing uh, to a brand new player who may not understand the system, you know. Is it straightforward yet deep and complex enough that it is fun to play over and over and it gives you a good feel for how the game can expand and the different opportunities the game offers? Uh, but also, are the sides balanced, you know? Um, is, is because you have a limited selection and you're going to play with what's out of that box for several times, we want to make sure that the win ratio is about 50-50, right? And the player skill is going to factor in more heavily than, say, the models that you just happen to include in that box. And it's, it's a long process, um, but it's well worth the effort. How much effort did you put into, uh, or into any kind of market research of who's actually buying that starter box and whether they're actually using it? I mean, you, what you just described sounds great as an ideal thing, but how many people are actually existing players of the game who either just want to get the Mark II rule set in a nice, cheap form plus a bunch of miniatures uh, versus ideally two new players? Um, we uh, we definitely monitor uh, uh, the community and we try to get keep our our, uh, our finger on you know which factions are well represented, which factions are the most popular. Um, we run polls online. We uh, we tabulate tournament results. We watch different major events to see where things are coming out. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, uh, really even uh, even the least popular faction is still still well represented in this game. There's no dark horse cannon um, based on the information that we've gathered, and I think you see that through tournament results as well if you watch uh, any major events and things like that. Um, local stores uh, and player groups there, I know that can fluctuate pretty wildly, but across, across the board, what we've seen is that some factions do rise to the top, but it's by very slim margins compared to others.